up in the morning, huh? <laughs> From the North Sea to the world's coolest city, what an obscure Danish word can teach us about building a thriving community. Everyone who cooks has an obligation to do something meaningful for other people, for the unborn. In this episode of The Food Principle. For 20 years, I've used food as a catalyst to connect travelers with local culture around the world. Yet food does even more than connect us. It also plays a pivotal role in some of our greatest challenges. Now I'm on a quest to learn from leaders in the vanguard of these battles. All using the power of food to plant a better planet. I'm Jim Kane, and this is The Food Principle. Spend any amount of time in Copenhagen, and it's easy to see why Denmark is perennially ranked among the happiest nations on Earth. Everything seems designed to maximize quality of life and to integrate nature, healthy lifestyles, and social connection into everyday living. From biking, boating, and kayaking along the city's canals to swimming in its pristine harbor. I mean, look straight down here. This is like a, this is like a dreamscape. Live in the boat, boat like that. It looks like that. Yeah. And they can live in that. And of course, there's the food. From street fair to Michelin stars, artisan bakeries to maverick distilleries, the city's food scene pulses with an energy that goes way beyond influencers and accolades and taps directly into food's power to build communities and inspire change. During the COVID crisis, I ran across an old Danish word that had been resurrected to become Denmark's word of the year in 2020, samfundsint. It represents a sense of social responsibility that many feel helped the Danes navigate the pandemic better than most. And with so many of the biggest issues we face requiring collective action, I wondered if Samfunsind might offer lessons for the rest of us. Yeah, we go fishing. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. If anyone could help me understand this concept of Samfunsind, it was Klaus Meyer, one of the architects of the new Nordic Manifesto that helped transform Danish food culture. When Klaus invites you to his beach house to check the nets, you say yes, even if you're not exactly sure what this entails. No, now I'm just checking everything that is in the net, if, that, in the net. if there's anything okay. in the net. What we make from it? That depends. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we have a, a poisonous uh, devil that uh, is super good fried, hand fried. Okay. You don't die from it, but you... As long as you remove that, you're okay. As long as you don't get that in your hand, you're fine. One of the founding figures of the New Nordic Movement, Klaus Meyer is a social entrepreneur, author, TV host, and co-founder of the world-renowned restaurant Noma. He's fueled by a desire to be an agent of change. It's a good idea to be available for the And considers it like oxygen to create a moment of joy or hope for others. I'm wondering about your thoughts on Samfunsin through the lens of food, if maybe there are elements in the New Nordic Manifesto about that? It's all about that. It's all about actually uh, stepping up uh, and taking, uh, taking upon you uh, a, a responsibility for the big issues in life. It's, it's about the fact that everyone who cooks has an obligation or an opportunity to do something meaningful for other people, for the unborn. And uh, once you face that, that opportunity, it's very difficult to not care. This process, this new Nordic cuisine movement became so visible. And, and suddenly to see a whole industry, I mean, thousands of chefs uh, trying to uh, be co-creators of change, 
probably has, has reinforced something that was already part of, of Danishness. food system thinkers here that are doing not just innovative things, but things that are reconnecting us, you know, to the roots of, of where the food's coming from. How the heck did this all happen? I, I got a chance to witness the golden age of French gastronomy and the concept of terroir, which is the idea that uh, food should taste of where you are. And, and due to the fact that I found love and meaning and deliciousness in, in the very same place, it became very clear to me that something was absolutely rotten uh, in Denmark. I, I had found what felt like a calling and I, I wanted to, to change Danish food culture. And then in 2000, 17 years down that road, I said, I, I need to find a way to, to, to uh, induce this change. And that was the moment where I realized that what I've been doing for the first two decades of my adult life uh, was wrong. So I, I'd been an advocate of everything French. Instead of uh, importing and, and um, reflecting uh, France in Denmark, the obvious idea was to uh, start investigating the qualities and opportunities uh, sitting within our own landscapes. So I learned that actually you can decide to change a food culture. And if uh, chefs are driving this process of change, Apparently, um, it can impact the, the spirit and the food ways of an entire nation. It was not a matter of being the best in the world, neither for, for Noma or for the, 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 the food culture in Denmark as such. It was a matter of, of being a, a catalyst of a change. Wow. <laughs> we have an escapee, Klaus. Uh-oh. You know, the New Nordic manifesto and the New York cuisine is not just meant for high-end restaurants, uh, but also for, you know, uh, the, the person at home cooking something with, with apples and cabbage. And then also because if, if it's only a couple of chefs who, who, who does everything perfect, then it, 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 won't help, uh, it, w it won't help healing the food systems. What made the second go around uh, eventually successful? starting with a top-down approach, instead of running around single-handedly like a maniac trying to, to, to change vinegar, change coffee, change chocolate, uh, you know, wake up people, uh, then, then starting with sharing the big idea. That, 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 that approach became uh, hugely uh, successful. But what actually happened was that tens of thousands of people went out and did stuff on their own. Mm. Uh, but kind of in the name of the New Orleans cuisine. They wanted to contribute. Would you say this is a small average or a big catch? That's a very small catch. Very small catch. I would say. Yeah. Having survived the waves, the venomous fleecing, and Klaus's assessment of the visiting land lover, it was time to head over to the aspiringly named World's Best Picnic, a rock soup style gathering where everyone contributes a little something to the pot. We bought our summer house 15 years ago here in uh, Udsold Sand, uh, north of Copenhagen, close to the ocean. I guess that in the beginning I was a little bit exhausted by all these uh, projects in my foundation and all the things I wanted to change. Returning to Denmark was to see uh, the miracle in the very small things, see the fairy tale in, in the tiny project. And, and, and this in no way compares to changing to, to redefining resocialization or, or fighting poverty in Bolivia. Uh, but the world's best picnic, it was an invitation to the people living in this uh, kind of abandoned part of uh, the north of Sealand, chip in with their competences, create micro events and participate in a, in a bingo or in a quiz or in a morning run or in a meditation session. Even, I mean, the French word host, le hôte, means it's the same word for the, for the one preparing the meal and the one joining the meal. It's the same word. Okay. And the point is that what would a great dinner be without guests? 
It's, it's a micro reflection of the new Nordic cuisine movement in the way this is framed. It's not the new Nordic cuisine, it is the world's best picnic. And for this to become true, we need everybody to do a little bit. While Klaus's vision for food as a tool for change would start with high-profile chefs signing the new Nordic Manifesto, it didn't stop there. He knew that if this change was to spread, then every part of society must have an opportunity to be part of it, even the marginalized, even the incarcerated. I mean, for me, it has always been like almost like oxygen to, to create a moment of joy or to create a hope for other people. I mean, how beauty wouldn't it be if I could if I penetrate a closed state prison and, and, and teach Denmark the lesson that everybody uh, deserves a second chance in life? What, what with the opportunity to tell this story uh, wouldn't uh, reach out for it. And then I said, I think I can do it. I can convince the, the, the Warren that we can do this together and everything will be fine. And, and he will have a better culture in the prison and, and he will have fewer inmates in the future. If we can you know, teach them something, a trade, a craft, having somebody come and eat your food, also this kind of gets under your skin. And uh, besides the idea of, of earning a new competence, it actually turns you into a caring person. Klaus eventually found success by focusing on communicating the big idea. Another key was identifying individuals capable of driving change. Camilla Seidler and Meta Stradop were two such talents who led Klaus's ambitious social gastronomy projects in Bolivia and Brownsville. Camilla and Meta could have ended in many other kind of uh, life scenarios than the ones they ended into. And it's not that I taught them to be as great as they became, but I, I felt that they, they had the right uh, motivation, uh, the right values, and then the projects grew these capabilities within those two amazing ladies. While directing far-flung projects for Klaus may have grown Camilla and Meta's professional capacities, I would soon discover their talent for far-flung objects, specifically the tank. <laughs> the sun-kissed court on Lola's grounds is about as welcoming as you can imagine, which in a way led into our next conversation. Nice one. Nice one. Got it. Close. Camila Seidler wants to make restaurants more welcoming, equitable, and balanced. In other words, sustainable for the team as well as the planet. In 2016, while leading restaurant Gusto in Bolivia, Camila was named best female chef in Latin America. Now back in Copenhagen, she and her partners own Lola and Lola Impact. We're here in Denmark and in Copenhagen learning about Sam Funcin. I'd love to hear uh, from your perspective, just what Sam Funcin means to you. It's something very present in our society, uh, where you almost feel, you know, an anger toward injustice. I don't know why, but somehow it's just built into society that's this helping other people without being forced into it. I, I know you're living in this, in this, uh, uh, you know, magical juxtaposition between food and social impact for a lot of years. Why is it? Why is it that food is so so powerful in this sense? There's there's kind of like a, a full ecosystem going on here, and that also means that there's space for everybody. The Nordic movement had done so much for for Nordic gastronomy and how the tourism has had been pushed forward. Uh, uh, the gastronomy, you know, sector in general has really improved from from the 80s and 90s, where it was quite horrible. <laughs> um, only a couple of good French restaurants maybe and an Italian here and there to suddenly being the epicenter of international gastronomy. And putting all this into a context of like foreign aid and you know third world country and all of these things that you can you know all the caps you can drag over Bolivia's head. It just kind of makes complete sense that if by improving gastronomy and enhancing you know the quality and the level uh, in tourism in general, of course you can make more money and you can, you know, improve people's lives from the potato producer to the culinary student to the hotel manager, uh, kind of, it's a full circle. 
there's so many ways that you can be included in this business. Uh, you don't have to speak the language. You can be shown something and then you know, peel a carrot. You know what peeling a carrot is. You don't need to have complicated, long, uh, you know, lessons on how to do your job. So it's very welcoming. It's it can be on a very, you know, basic level, and then you can grow within that business. When we first met. You described uh, Lola as a big, beautiful, effing circus. We have the privilege of having a very mixed team. Uh, so many from London, Lucas from, uh, from Denmark, but with an Italian background. We have Otavia, Italian waiter. Then we have Tamek, who's from Poland. Then we have Renata from Bolivia. We have David from India, we, and so on and so on. So it's like every day you come into work, it's like the UN. It feels a little bit more like, like a family kind of thing without the 90 hour work weeks were like, yeah, we're family, but like, like a true family. <laughs> and you can help yourself with the other tweezer just to push it in so you get a, an interesting shape. Ah, yeah. <laughs> that was both uh, super dorky and uh, I'm glad I Very caught impressive. it. Because I was, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was like the dork ninja. It was like uh, the combination. So I'm just dropping. Just drop it, yeah, and then you'll see that it starts bubbling a bit. And then, I kind of help. And then you can, yeah, help it okay. get like a, a funky shape. There you go, and then when it stops bubbling, you can just take it up, okay. sort of uh, drain it. Yeah, perfect. How do you go from the traditional hierarchy when it's you know yes chef mm. to empowering your your fellow team members to really feel like they're making decisions and and helping you co-create? I think one of the 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 easiest way to see it is on the menu. The food being served is often a mix of an idea David had with something where I maybe added something and then Renata, you know, took it to Southeast Asia for a while. It's fine to have a place that just serves food and wine, but it should also be a place that can do a little more. It has to be a restaurant that can change somebody's life for the better. <laughs> Meta Stratup was forged in fine dining, but would fall in love with teaching and the special connection to be had over a cutting board. Teaching in the prison program and later in Brownsville, New York, brought her into contact with Camilla and the work being done in Bolivia. When Meta returned to Denmark, the partnership beckoned, but only if it had a social impact. Meta had uh, visited us in Bolivia because she was going to Brownsville, New York to do a very similar project uh, with Klaus Meyer's Melting Pot Foundation. She used to be a teacher at the uh, Meyer's culinary classes uh, where my brother had attended like after school culinary classes for kids. She was like, I have to tell you something. I'm going back to Denmark. I'm like, oh, that's perfect. Let's open a restaurant. And she was like, yeah, no, no, no. I got a job. No, no, thanks. But sounds good. Let, let me hear about it when I get there. You know, Camille, you met her now. She's persistent and she knows what she wants. We had a coffee and she's like, you know what? I got this, uh, <laughs> this uh, weird meeting with this woman. She has this old mill crescent town. Can you just come with me? And we saw this place and it was completely destroyed. It was so old and it was like falling apart, but beautiful. This has potential, huge potential. If we don't have a social aspect of this, it's another restaurant is just another restaurant. So for me, I'm not on board if we don't have a social uh, impact. Lola Impact offers inclusion and employment as it reincorporates people at society's margins by teaching them to cope as well as to cook. In this food truck, life skills are as important as knife skills. I was a female chef and it was 12 male uh, drug dealers or murders, so it was like, no thank you. So I was super nervous. And I went with one of the boys, so I wasn't going by myself. And all this locking like gates and it was Gosh. very dramatic and going yeah. through this detector and stuff. So I decided to be there a couple of days and just fell completely in love with the whole thing. I absolutely fell in love with the connection you can have over a bloody chopping board. It's the conversations, the feelings, the kind of different stories you get from so many different kinds of people. To find out we all have issues, we all, and, and what it can really do, like a big dinner and cooking together, it can bring out emotions, right? It's like, okay, let's do a bonus, and then in the middle of that you can still, you know, come into deep conversations in life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's where it all started. Very cool. Yeah. What are you doing at Lola Impact and how are you taking people in and how are you training them up? For me it's what you can do with food and people. And it's also to learn these young adults how to kind of get a real job. 
when they, they, it is a real job, but how to be an adult and take responsibility for your own life, how to save up money, how to not uh, come to work super drunk or super hungover that you don't know how to spell your own name. But I mean, if you're not taking life and yourself seriously, then they will catch up at you at some point, and then you either end up like a bum or you have success, but at least you need to try and, you know, when you come over a certain age, you need to kind of, you can't live the crazy uh, young life, you need to also have responsibilities, and that's what we kind of teach them. So for me, and what I've been telling Rune and Camilla, it's super important that we pay the young uh, kids. They are a part of this company just like anybody else. I am depending on them just like anybody else. So for me to, to recognize that to them and to give them the trust that if they're not there, I'm, I can't open the shop, I can't be there by myself, you saw how busy it is. So I'm depending on them 100%. It's not lower level, but it's a different kind of thing. It's it's a food truck, so it's uh, it's tacos, it's burritos, it's it's more like casual uh, food. Both Med and I come very much from, of course, the last couple of years, social gastronomy. But before that, Michelin world, super tight tweezers, you know, in in it, don't yell in the kitchen, don't. And then you walk into this food truck where you're just like, <laughs> oh my god. The other day I was like, you guys need to shut up for a minute. Like you talk too much. Now you work, and and then they turn around and yeah yes boss you know and they and they don't feel at all you know you know attacked or anything they're just like then they laugh a little bit of themselves and then yeah we talk too much yeah yeah <laughs> so then doing a shift at Lola and then taking a shift down there is two different worlds um, but these two still have to communicate and have the same philosophy and have the same principles and so on yeah um, so it's it's uh, it's an interesting. Uh, moment to, to merge these two businesses. It's also this feeling of that you belong, belonging somewhere and I think for a lot of these kids it's also, you know, that's a great opportunity in this whole uh, culinary industry. Yeah. At the end of the day I can't stop smiling. This place makes me insane a lot of days because it's so tiny. It's like having eight kids sometimes and I don't have kids. But then looking at these young dudes, it's like everything. Number 60. So we're going to have a very fresh watermelon and mint salad with uh, feta cheese and olives. And then we have some uh, fresh new potatoes. Examples of Samfunsind abound in Copenhagen, like Absalon a formerly abandoned church reimagined as a community hub, offering daily dinners that bring people together from all walks of life to eat, talk, and feel connected. What better way to break bread with my two new friends? Of course, the idea that solidarity should extend to neighbors and strangers isn't solely Danish, but just as new Nordic cooking to refocus our attention on seasonality, food relationships, and ecosystems, maybe Samfunsind can help us more clearly see each other as part of one big human family. This way of approaching life is crossing borders. There are no borders to it. I mean, we are not done. I mean, we are fighting against the clock. If we want to create a future that is full of opportunities for our grandchildren, I think the, the, the closer uh, we get to the point of uh, no return, the more people will step up. Some people say that, that if only we can get the food systems right, much of the problems that we are facing as a civilization will be solved. Uh, and, and if you are, is, are we done? No, we, we have barely started. On the next episode of The Food Principle. From caring cyclists to pioneering pollinators, how inspiration and collaboration can shift mindsets and expand ripples of change. Why isn't food still the most important thing in their life? Because it's affecting their health and how they live on a daily basis.
Funding for the Food Principle is made possible by the ETV Endowment of South Carolina, the International Caterers Association Educational Foundation, and Visit Denmark.